out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment your needs to supply. Reach out. Tonight, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to the book of Psalms, Psalm 65, Praise for God's Salvation. We're going to look at Psalm 65 and talk about this wonderful song of harvest blessing. It's attributed to King David, and it's believed to coincide with the festival of uh, Feast of First Fruits, and um, it's a, a wonderful thanksgiving to God for the harvest, for the provision that he gives us. And uh, Kelly is going to read the psalm, and then we're going to talk about it. And uh, as always, let's open in prayer, shall we? Yes. Heavenly Father, thank you for your salvation and for your providence. We ask, Lord, that tonight help us to be really grateful. Help us to be grateful for your salvation and for your divine providence. We love you, Father. In your name we pray, amen. Amen and amen. I want to give the background first and then we'll get into the psalm. Um, we're talking about the feasts of the Lord. Leviticus chapter 23, you don't need to turn to it, but Leviticus chapter 23 talks about the feasts of the Lord that God wanted celebrated. He talked in verse 3 about the Sabbath. And in verse 4, he talked about the Passover and unleavened bread. And then in verse 9, he talked about the feast that we believe is being celebrated here in this song. And that's the Feast of First Fruits. It's a very interesting one. Uh, Leviticus 23, beginning in verse 9. And Kelly is going to read verses 9 through 14 to talk about this feast of first fruits. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to, the children of, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheaf, a male lamb of the first year, without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to the Lord, for a sweet aroma, and its drink offering shall be of wine, one-fourth of a hin. You shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. This is referring to the barley harvest, which would be in the springtime in Israel. And they uh, were told that you are not to eat of that harvest until the first fruits have been offered to God. Give God the first fruits in thanksgiving for the promise of the full harvest yet to come. And so they would take uh, some sheaves, the priest would take some sheaves, wave it to the Lord in a sense saying, thank you for this harvest. We give you the honor and the thanksgiving for providing for us. Mm -hmm. And they were then to uh, have an offering of grain and also of a lamb and also of wine. And it was a way of saying, thank you, Lord, for your provision. Uh, through the years, I've had several occasions where people in the congregation felt led to make an offering of first fruits, and uh, that consisted of their getting a new job and bringing in the uh, full paycheck for the first two weeks of that job, saying, Lord, I thank you for this job, and I give you the first fruits of it, and sow it into your kingdom, and look forward to the future prospects and blessings of this. And uh, to my knowledge, they were mightily, mightily blessed, giving God the first part of their income, giving God the first part of the barley harvest here. 
Uh, we do the same thing in a sense with our tithing. We tithe uh, not over what's left over, but we give the first tenth of our income to the Lord. And uh, we say, thank you, Lord, this first tenth is yours. And we also know the other 90% is yours, but thank you that you'll give us wisdom and direction on how to use it for the expenses that we have in living. But it's putting God first. Putting God first in your day. Putting God first in your worship in the thoughts and the intents and the direction, putting God first in everything in our lives. First fruits, it belongs to you. Well, this was a song that probably was written by David, Psalm 65, uh, thanking God for his wonderful harvest. It's a song really of harvest blessing. Psalm 65, let's begin with verse one. Praise is awaiting you, O, you, o God, in Zion. And to you the vow shall be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you all flesh will come. Iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, you will provide atonement for them. Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple." By, right, by awesome deeds in righteousness you will answer us, O God of our salvation, you who are the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of the far-off seas, who established the mo mountains by his strength, being clothed with power, you who still the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the peoples. They also who dwell in the farthest parts are afraid of your signs. You make the outgoings of the morning and evening rejoice. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain. For so you have prepared it. You water its ridges abundantly. You settle its furrows. You make it soft with showers. You bless its growth. You crown the year with your goodness, and your paths drip with abundance. They drop on the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered with grain. They shout for joy. They also sing. A wonderful song of praise and thanksgiving to God for his salvation, for his providence, for his provision. So back to verse 1, praise is awaiting you, O God, in Zion. Isn't that a wonderful way to start the day, to say, Lord, praise is waiting for you. Come on in, Lord. Of course, he's always there, but come on in, Lord. Praise is here for you. Thanksgiving is here. And to you, the vow shall be performed. I am going to perform what I have promised to do. I, I love that. that's us. Yeah. I love that verse. And uh, he says, verse 2, O you who hear prayer... To you all flesh will come. Iniquities prevail against me. There's an honest understanding that I have sins in my life. Iniquities prevail against me. And as for our transgressions, you will provide atonement for them. What a wonderful expression of faith. Here's a man who wrote uh, a thousand years before Christ came. His descendant, Jesus Christ, would provide atonement for transgressions. And the word transgress from the Hebrew means rebellion. Oh, transgression sounds much more calm. And Well, I just transgressed. I just kind of trespassed onto ah. something I shouldn't be doing. No, it's rebellion. And it comes right from Adam and Eve right on down. It's rebellion, but God will provide atonement. And the interesting word for atonement here, kofar, means to cover. Because in the Old Testament, all the atonement could do was to cover sins. Didn't remove them. Because the only way for sins to be removed would be by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. But the blood of Christ had not been shed a thousand years before he came. And so the worst uh, or the best they could do was to just do animal sacrifices, slit the throats of lambs and bulls and break the necks of, uh, of, uh, of pigeons and so and so. It, uh, it took the blood of Christ to remove that sin. And out of the 8 billion people in this world today, only 2 billion have any idea, so they say, about the atonement of Christ. What about the other 6 billion? What are they doing for it? What I don't understand is 
um, the Jews know, the Jewish Orthodox Jew, they know about the blood covering, right? They, kn they know all the rules and the laws and the ordinances. Now they also know that they don't do them anymore. So what, it, what do they consider um, that w how they can bring themselves to the God? Is it just the Torah? Uh, on Yom Kippur, when they celebrate the uh, Day of Atonement, they have different ways of doing it. They'll, they'll fast. Uh, I used to live in Albany, and uh, you know, there was a, a very strong Jewish community I lived in, and they would go down to the pond at Buckingham Pond, and they would throw bread into the pond, symbolic of their sins. So here's my, my sins, and I throw it into the pond, and all it did basically was choke the poor geese that were flying, and... Uh, it sure didn't. And uh, so, but they do try to live righteous and obey the laws no, and rules. And sure. I, I get that. And, so, and, and, and others do as well. Best efforts. My good deeds will get me into heaven. No, 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 no. No, so that's all self-righteousness. If it's not the blood of Christ, then they're working on their own. My self-righteousness will get me into heaven. That's not the scriptures. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the soul that sins shall surely die. So the only way is for God to provide atonement, and David knew in the Old Testament that he would provide that atonement through those animal sacrifices brought in faith. But now in the New Testament, we come to Jesus Christ who has atoned for our sins. And, but I, you know, and I get that, because uh, I have the blood of Christ and I believe that. But I, I am so stuck in how they don't understand at one time they had to have the lambs, right? If you follow everything in the Old Testament, what do you do, rip those pages out? We don't do that anymore? Now I'm glad they don't use, kill those little lambs anymore, right? I'm very happy they don't do them. I'm glad they don't slit the, 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 and that I know they're very righteous with food and the kosher and the way they kill the animals. I, I, I know all that. but. My point is, as, you know, looking through a, the Jewish eyes, I just can't wrap my head around how you, if we had to have that before, and yet we do everything else, but we don't do the blood covering, how come we're not doing some kind of blood? Do you see, you see what I'm saying? Like we lost something. There was a piece lost there. Right. And the Orthodox Jews want that, and they want the temple returned. Right. And there will be a man who will come and help them to build their temple. And they will follow him until that man walks into the temple three and a half years into his reign and says, I am God, worship me. And then they'll realize the horrible mistake they made as they're forced to try to worship the Antichrist. So pray for people to come to the only atonement that God has ever provided or ever will provide, the blood of his perfect son, Jesus Christ. And pray for the veil to be removed. That's right. And this was the struggle that the Apostle Paul had. Why do you think he ended up in jail in, in, the, in Rome? Because the Jews had uh, turned against him. They, they were the main ones that came against him all through his ministry. And uh, all of the, the persecutions and I'm not being anti-Semitic in saying this, it's just simply the fact that the Jews would not accept the sacrifice that God had provided. And so they still to this day, even in my family, half my family is Jewish, and they will not accept the Messiah. They will not accept Jesus. And so uh, I love them, but uh, as far as their future is concerned, I hate to be very candid, but the Lord's saying this, you don't want me here on earth, then I'm not going to burden you to have me here for eternity. You want nothing to do with me now, then you'll have nothing to do with me for eternity. Very sad. But pray for them because it's not over until it's over. In any event, let's get on to our psalm here. Verse 4, blessed is the man you choose. Are you grateful that God chose you for salvation if you're saved? He chose you. Well, I chose God. No, Jesus said to the disciples, you didn't choose me. I chose you. If you're chosen, you be grateful for that. Blessed is the man you choose and cause to approach you, that he may dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, of your holy temple. So when God chooses you, 
He brings you into his courts. He gives you his goodness, brings you into his house, into the very holy of holies, the inner sanctum, mm. the sanctuary. Wow. And that word temple there means an absolute mansion. God's going to allow you to come right into the throne room of God when you get to heaven. You're not going to need a surrogate. Don't need to go to Mary and say, Mary, could you please talk to your son, Jesus? Uh, Gabriel, would you please get a message to uh, Michael? And to one, no, You go directly to the Lord yourself because he chose you for salvation. What a wonderful, wonderful privilege. Well, he goes on now, and let's read verses 5, 6, and 7, and 8 one more time. By awesome deeds in righteousness you will answer us, O God of our salvation, you who are, who are the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of the far-off seas, who established the mountains by his strength, being clothed with power, you who still the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the peoples. They also who dwell in the farthest parts are afraid of your signs. You make the outgoings of the morning and evenings rejoice. Here we see the sovereignty of God. He controls all of creation, all of nature. Look at verse 5. By awesome deeds in your righteousness, you will answer us. God will answer when you call on him. The apostle Paul said, call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, it doesn't make any difference. He will save you. You who are the confidence of all the ends of the earth. And so all those who call upon him are confident that he'll be there. Amen. He is the God of our salvation. And that word salvation, Yeshua, in the Hebrew means uh, provision. It means providence. It means guidance. It means complete salvation and deliverance. And that is the name of Jesus. The Lord is our salvation. And then he goes on to say in verses 9 and 10 that uh, God is the one who gives us our wonderful provision here on earth. Physical provision, spiritual provision. Let's look at verses 9 and 10 again. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its ridges abundantly. You settle its furrows. You make it soft with showers. You bless its growth. So it's God who gives us something as basic as rain, something we don't uh, often think about, something we take for granted. And yet right now, in this year, in August of 2022, Europe is going through the worst drought they have had in 500 years. Wow. China is a very godless country, trying to become God themselves. What are they doing? They're sending airplanes up to seed the clouds to try to force the rain, <laughs> because we're going to make it joke. rain. We're going to make it rain. How's that working for you? Save your gas. And here in this area and around uh, this country, this has been one of the driest summers we've had. And the governor of Texas yesterday was talking about his condition. Um, he cannot talk about uh, climate control because that's against his party. But he talks about extreme weather. Well, whatever you want to call it, they're having real extreme weather. Drought and then floods down there. And man thinks he's the master of his own fate. We all depend upon God. You thank God for the rain when it comes. We finally had rain. The good news was it came today. The bad news was it was over in 10 minutes. <laughs> and that doesn't do much for anything. But uh, the God is the one who gives us whatever we have. Be grateful for it. Be grateful because it might not always be. And right now we're having a war in the Ukraine, as we know. And uh, grain shipments are uh, held back. And uh, the, the world is is uh, about to be in very, very strained, uh, strained condition as far as food, uh, for very, very, very much of a food crisis. So, and, uh, I, and I just have to add that because I've always held on to that one little line there. And re what's it? Jesus said, "A day's wages will be for a loaf of bread in those times." It's coming up in Revelation. That's it's right. It's coming close. It could be coming close. Yeah, as prices are going up higher and higher for uh, food. And whatever, there are, there are many who are very food insecure right now all over the world. They want us to eat bugs. Yeah. It's all, uh, it's, it's a Crickets. difficult time. But when are we going to turn That's to God? That's really true. When are we going to turn to God? They need, they need to turn to God. Yeah. <laughs> and as you look at the news, I don't hear anybody saying, hey, let's turn to God. 
No. Uh, about this, this, this whole world situation here. They're just all complaining about it. They're trying to seed the clouds and all this nonsense. But man is stubborn. Man is stubborn, just does not want to turn to God. But David was not that stubborn. He loved God. And he saw that, yes, the one that brings the rain down is God. The one that gives the flowers, the one that gives us the grain. Um, he's the one that we want to thank. And that's what this psalm is all about, thanking God for the most basic of things, grain, food, shelter, and all that we have. Let's close it with verses 11 through 13 as he talks about the abundant provision of God's harvest. You crown the year with your goodness, and your paths drip with abundance. They drop on the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered with grain. <clears throat> they shout for joy. They also sing. So David saw that God was the one who provided the rain, the crops, the lambs, uh, just everything in life that we have comes from him. You know, life is pretty simple, and that is that God is the one that gave us all goodness. But as we don't turn to God, and most of the world does not, they're trying to figure out how they can do this for themselves, and it's not working. It is not working. We need to pray for a major revival worldwide. We talk about revival in this country, yes. We talk about revival all over the world. But where does revival start? It starts in my heart within me. Lord, change me. Bring me back to you. And I want to serve you and love you. And, and Kelly's going to lead us in a prayer right now that we can turn to the Lord. We need atonement. We're sinners. All of us are sinners. All have come sin. have come short of God's glory. We need atonement. We need the blood of Christ. You say, but I'm not sure that God chose me. Well, you call upon him and say, Lord, choose me. Save me. And Romans 10 tells us that he will do that. So let's pray, shall we? Yes. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Father, we ask that you would remove the veil from the eyes of these people who are praying with me tonight. Lord, remove their veil. Help them to see themselves as sinners in need of a Savior. Help them, Lord, to want the atonement, the atonement for sin, Jesus. He died. He died for us. That blood not only covers the sin, but it washes it away. Yes, Lord. So that we can have a relationship with the Lord, with the, with the Father, with you. There's one mediator, one root. We know that blood is in, it's a... It's an avenue. It's a medium. It's where everything floats through our body. And Lord, all the salutes and the different things that live in there. We, well, we need your blood. We need the blood that cleanses us from all those things, all those salutes. <laughs> we could call them sins and things that are ungodly the thoughts, the hidden intentions of our heart, all those things that are wicked, things we think in our mind about other people, things that we hide. Only you could wash it away, Lord. And then make us new. Give us a desire to, to live pure, right for you, to, to try every day, to shake it off, start over each day, each day gets better as we live for you. We break those old habits and we live for righteousness. We die to self and live for Christ. Father, we ask that today would be a day of salvation for someone. That today they would call on the name of the Lord. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. And the wages when we go to work, we get paid for something, right? We get a paycheck. The, but the wages of sin is death. Because you committed sin, you are destined to eternal death. Hell. A lot of people don't want to hear that word hell, but you're destined for hell. 
The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What do we have to do? The only thing we have to do is believe that Jesus died on the cross, rose again. That's the payment for our sins. We don't have to have that, the wages of sin anymore. We don't have to pay it with death. We don't, we don't have to go to hell. We can go to heaven. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. It's as simple as that. People think, oh, I don't want to be a holy roller. It's as simple as that. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If these scriptures mean something to you, pray with us. If you're ready to accept Jesus as your Savior. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. I admit I am a sinner. I admit I am a sinner. And I repent of my sins. And I repent of my sins. I believe Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe Jesus Christ died for my sins. And was raised from the dead. And was raised from the dead. As payment for those sins. As payment for those sins. I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, for my new spiritual life. Thank you, Lord, for my new spiritual life. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. And God bless you. If you just gave your heart to Christ, welcome to the family of God. Ask the Lord to show you where to fellowship. Find a church in your area that's faithfully teaching his word. If we can help you here at Reach Out, just contact us. You can go on our website, reachoutfellowship.com, reachoutfellowship.com. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. Shalom. Let's open our Bibles tonight to the Old Testament book of Psalms. We're going to look at Psalm 66. Praise to God for his awesome works. And uh, we're going to see, we don't know who wrote this Psalm. It's not attributed to David. He might have written it, maybe he didn't. The important thing is God wrote it. And it's talking about God's wonderful, awesome works. And it's a song of Israel and it should be a song of our hearts as well. Uh, God is awesome, and his works in our lives are awesome. And Kelly's going to open us in prayer. Gracious Father, thank you for this opportunity to read Psalm 66. We ask that you to be with us tonight. Help us to be encouraged and changed through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. We're going to see here that the nation was instructed to praise God. Uh, this person is a leader of uh, the nation, so I would think it probably is David even though that name is not mentioned, because I don't think that the ordinary uh, uh, songwriter of Israel, such as Asaph and the others, would be able to speak for the whole nation, maybe so, but in any event, the important thing is that the, uh, the hymn writer here is uh, instructing the whole nation to praise God uh, in the first 12 verses, and then verses 13 to 20, uh, the, uh, psalm, the psalmist is actually leading them in praise. So uh, let's uh, read... Uh, let's go through the first 12 verses at the beginning, and then we'll talk about the last remaining ones. Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you, and shall sing praises to your name. Come and see the works of God. He is awesome in his doing toward the sons of men. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the river on foot. There we will rejoice in him. He rules by his power forever. His eyes observe the nations. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves. Oh, bless our God, you peoples, and make the voice of his praise to be heard. Who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved, for you, O Lord, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but you brought us out to rich fulfillment. Amen. And now the final verses, 13 to 20. I will go into your house with burnt offerings. I will 
pay you my vows, which my lips have uttered and my mouth has spoken. When I was in trouble, I will offer you burnt sacrifices of fat animals with the sweet aroma of rams. I will offer bulls and goats. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I would declare what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and he was ext- Stoled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. But certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, who has not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Beautiful psalm of praise about our awesome, awesome God. He says in verse 1, Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. And uh, that's a good example of how we should open up our worship. There's nothing wrong with shouting unto God. King David did that when they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. And uh, he had the uh, ephod of, the, of a priest, and he was just twirling. His wife, Michal, was very upset with him that it was not uh, proper decorum. And he said, uh, I'll do even more than this to praise my God. <laughs> so make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Uh, make sure that the shout, though, is sincere, not just for the welfare of others around you, but for God, that you're sincerely grateful to him for all he has done. You know, we yell and scream at baseball games and football games and rock concerts and what have you. Um, but, Boy, uh, could my father yell at the Giants and I'll the Yankees. He could, you know. Oh, and, uh, you've yeah. never seen anyone yell so hard. And then when you see Casey and the Sunshine Band coming out, those fans would, what, scream and yell, right? Uh, how about doing it for God? How about yelling for him? Say, Lud, you're, you're wonderful. Sing out the honor of his name. Oh, his Elvis name has left the building. Honor. <laughs> but Jesus Christ has not has left the not. building. Has not. Hallelujah. Amen. Make his praise glorious and say to God, here's something to say to him tomorrow morning or even tonight. How awesome are your works. Say that to God. Talk to him personally. Lord, your works are awesome. Lord, your works are awesome. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to Whoa, you. Whoa, here's a good one, Robin. The enemies are going to be submitting themselves to you. Lord, COVID's going to be submitting itself to you. Poverty is going to submit itself to you. Food insecurity is going to uh, sub- submit How itself. How about the Lord has the enemies? Stubborn, my stubborn will is going to submit to you, Lord. Mm-hmm. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. Amen. Oh, what a glorious time that's going to be. We don't see much of that now, but we will in the millennium. We're going to see praise and worship to the Lord for a thousand years. Hallelujah. Lord, but why wait for a thousand years? And of course, you're going to see that probably before that thousand years. You're going to be in heaven most likely Jack, before maybe that. you and I will be neighbors. And so we're going to find that the praise is going on in heaven right now. We don't know exactly what's going on in heaven. All we know is what Revelation 4 and 5 tell us, Mm -hmm. that they are praising God. And that's where your your beloved father is right now, and he's praising God. He was yelling for the Yankees down here, but he's yelling for Jesus up there. And uh, that's, that's going to be praising the Lord morning, noon, and night. How wonderful that's going to be. Well, he says in verse 5, come and see the works of God. And that's a good invitation to others and to ourselves. See what he's done. Get into the Gospels. See what Jesus did in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. See what he's done in my life. See the testimonies of his wonderful works. So read verses 5 through 7 again, would you dare? Come and see the works of God. He is awesome in his doing. Toward the sons of men, he turned the sea into dry land. They went through the river on foot. Then we will rejoice in him. He rules by his power forever. His eyes observe the nations. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves. So he turned the river into dry land. That's referring to the River Jordan as they had trudged through the wilderness. They had that faith already exercised with the Red Sea. Remember how the Red Sea had dried up and they walked over on dry land. Forty years later, the river dried up. uh, River Jordan, they walked over on dry land again. And uh, he did that then, and he can do wonders for us today as well. Amen. There's nothing too great for our God. So we're going to rejoice in him. He rules by his power forever. Mm. His eyes observe the nations. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves. So God sees what's going on all over the world. He sees the efforts of man to exalt himself. There's so many efforts to try to what I call rebuild the Tower of Babel, 
We see it going on in political circles. We see it in medical circles. We see it even in our own hearts. Every time we are sinning and trying to exalt ourselves, oh. we are building the Tower of Babel. What was that little uh, nursery rhyme? Oh, what a tale we tell when what we weave. They are all weaving their little... They're yeah. all weaving their little special things. Medicine is so wonderful. Yeah, okay, it helps. You know, politics, oh, that's ideology. We're saving these people. <gasps> this problem. How about everybody? I, I, it's so sad. It's so right. sad. It's sad. It's just sad. It's just sad. The efforts of man is... Uh, God is, is it. Yeah. He's it. So he goes on now in verses uh, 8 through 12 to tell us about how we are to bless God and thank God for all he has done. Let's read 8 through 12. Here. Oh, bless our God, you peoples, and make the voice of his praise to be heard, who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our fit feet to be moved. For you, O oh God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid a thick affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but you brought us out to rich fulfillment. That's right. So here we get a very honest understanding of God and how fire he works and water. in our lives. Uh, he says in verse 8, Oh, bless our God, you peoples. And we should be encouraging people around us to bless God with praise and worship and adoration. Make the voice of his praise to be heard. Let's get the voice of praise out there among the people who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved. I like that. He keeps Who's the it. one who keeps us alive? I really like that. Yeah. Who's the one who keeps us alive? It's God. He's the one who will not allow us to have our feet moved. I wonder how many times today I could have been killed in an accident. I had to drive to the dentist's office about 15 minutes from here and 15 minutes back. How many accidents could have ended my life in those 30 minutes of that driving, and uh, look at your, how about uh, events of your body? How about uh, the fact that your body could have stopped breathing at any moment? How many times has he spared us? He has allowed our, our feet not to be moved. But while he keeps us and preserves us, he also tests us. That is a mature thought, mm. verse Nine. It's an immature thought that some have said, God wants us happy, he wants us blessed, he wants God everything is working, love. et cetera. No, God God's also, is love. God's going to test us as well. Look at, let's read verses 10 through 12 again. For you, O oh God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, but you brought us out to rich fulfillment. So there's that balance. God, in verse 9, does not allow our feet to be moved or to slip. He knows the number of our days. He's going to take care of us to fulfill our purpose here on earth. He will not allow the feet to be moved, but on the other hand, he's going to test us. He's going to put us through some difficult times. You have refined us as silver is refined. Why do you refine silver? Why do you put silver into the fire? To purify, to get rid of the impurities. Amen. Exactly. So he's going to put us through fire to get rid of the impurities. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. Those are all tests, aren't they? But you brought us out to rich fulfillment, rich abundance. God put the Jews through many afflictions in Egypt, through the wilderness for 40 years, but then brought them into the abundance of Canaan. All the work which the Canaanites had done to plant seeds and to harvest and what have you, all that was ready for them when they came in. And so God is going to bless us, but he's going to bless us by putting us through the net, putting us into Does this testing. sound like you, something that you're familiar with? Sure. Yeah. This morning when I was in the dentist's office. You get office, to know the character of God. You can yeah. see your own, it in your life, right? 
You know, I was thinking about this in the dentist's office today uh, about our lives. I was just thinking about Psalm 90, verse 10. Uh, let's, let's read the whole verse, verse 10. Christians like to leave the first part in and the last part out. Verse 10. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years. Oh, goody, goody, goody. I'm going to have 70 years, and if by God's grace it's going to be 80 years, and praise God, he can give us 80 years. I claim that, Jesus, and all that comes with it. All right, but read the rest of the verse. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So I'm going to have 80 years by God's strength and grace, but it's going to be filled with happiness and, and good times and hallelujahs. It's also going to be with labor and sorrow. Labor and sorrow. It's going to be difficult times. That's what he's talking about here. And incidentally, don't uh, spend too much time worrying about today because today is, is almost over. And then there's tomorrow. And it seems as though the days are getting shorter and faster. They're not, but it seems that way. And then we fly away, but we're with Jesus for eternity. So when you have difficulties here on earth, you praise God that he's still in control, an awesome deed. And my late mother had a good handle on this. When you're going through a difficult time, do two things. Number one, say, Lord, what's the lesson I'm supposed to learn in this experience? And number two, pray for everybody else in the world who's going through the same thing. Wow. So stop complaining, stop whining, oh, it's supposed to be a wonderful life. It is a wonderful life, but it's also one of trials and testings. I want to, to feel turn, wonderful uh, every day. But uh, it's going to turn do. us to the I Lord. I want to feel wonderful every day, but it doesn't always come out that way. But he's, he's, he's working it for our good, to develop our faith in him and to be a testimony to other people. Well, as a result of that, I'm going to worship him I'm going to thank him for all of his awesome deeds. And in those days, the way they did that is now described in verse 13. I will go into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows, which my lips have uttered and my mouth has spoken when I was in trouble. I will offer you burnt sacrifices of fat animals with the sweet, sweet aroma of rams. I will offer bulls with goats. So I'm going to worship you, Lord. I'm going to go into your house and I'm going to worship you and thank you for all that you're doing. You're, you're bringing me abundance, but you're also putting me through difficult times and bringing me through those difficult times in order to purify me. And I thank you for that. And because there is no human sacrifice here in 950 BC, I have to follow your law and I have to get my animals, I have to cut their throats, and I have to lay my hands on them and transfer my sins to them, cut their throats, not the priest, but I've got to cut the throat of that animal myself, and then that blood is going to be shed and I will have my sins covered uh, for, for one year until, this goes on and on, until 950 years from now, Jesus will come and offer his life, his body, his blood for our sins. So in those days, they had to go through animal sacrifices of bulls and goats and pigeons and what have you. Today, how do we do it? By going into his temple. Where is his temple? Right here. What do we do? We deal with the blood as it was and say, thank you, Jesus, for your blood, which cleanses me from all sin. And now I lift up my hands and worship you and thank you for the abundance and for the trials and the testings and the tribulations because they're going to purify me. That's the gospel. Not God is love and everything is all rosy. And you know, when I was reading that, you know what I saw? Like I had like, you know, you know how you get a spiritual vi vision? I, I kind of envisioned me and, and like walking into the church and throwing my offerings, throwing my vows and just throwing it because... That's what you got to do. And that's kind of a visual, what we have to do. That's right. Because if we knew, if we really understood, we do. Thank we God really understand. Can you imagine bringing your animal to the priest? Well, well here, here, here's, my, uh, here, here's Lulu, my, my, my lamb, and, and I have to go. I can't see this. Oh, no, no, the priest says, I'm not going to cut the throat. 
you lay your hands on Lulu and you transfer your sins to Lulu and here is the knife and we will help you Wait, and hold but, Lulu but, and you slit its throat. But wouldn't, and stop, I wish you would not say slit anymore. It makes me upset. What if, what, could we, can, we just, can we just say one thing? Did a woman have to do any of this? Oh, yeah. Because oh, yeah. I would be very, very, at that time, I'd be very hiding behind the man. That's right. He can do it. If she sinned, Oh, not only do you do it with Lulu, before the whole camp, before the three million Jews. Oh, there she goes again. There she goes with another animal. She was there yesterday, and what did she do? To, and you do it in front of everybody. That's why you can see how these people broke off and became gypsies and all this. They just, because they, they couldn't do it. So they, you know, they'd run off with this one, and they'd run off with that. You have all these different groups of people. Well, let's close it off now with worship uh, and the petition now for everybody to come and praise God for his awesome deeds. Verses 16 to 20. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear, but certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, who has not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Amen. So come in here, verse 16. And God will not turn away from you, no That's matter right. what. He loves you. All you who fear God, listen. I'll declare come what he has him. done. You tell others what God has done in your life. That's the best testimony that you can give. And then also make sure your life backs up your lips your testimony. Otherwise, it's nothing but hypocrisy, right? I cried to him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. I praised him. I blessed him with my tongue. And here's an important truth. Kelly read it in verse 18. Read it again. If I, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. That's right. That's why Isaiah said, you know, God's arm is not short that it can't save. His ear is not heavy that it can't hear, but it's your sins that have separated you from your God. But oh certainly Lord, God cleanse, has heard cleanse me. Cleanse me of all my sins. That's right. God has heard me. He's attended to the voice of my prayer. And finally, with the blessing of verse 20. Blessed be God who has not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. Bless the Lord, O oh my bless soul. Blessed be God. Close us in prayer, would you dare? Yes. Heavenly Father, we bless your holy name. We thank you. Blessed be our God who has not turned away from us. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. Bless your people tonight. In your son's name we pray, amen. Amen and amen. God bless you. Until the next time, shalom. Shalom. He's passing by this moment, your needs to supply.